Okay, hello everyone. I'm, I'm happy to introduce new, our next keynote speaker is Dr. Brian Charleston. Brian is a veterinarian from the Royal Veterinary College of London. He got that degree in 1982. And after a period of time in large animal practice, he studied for master's degrees in molecular biology at the University College of London in 1988. And then he got a PhD degree as a Wellcome Trust Scholar from the University of London in 1991. He carried out a postdoctoral research as a Wellcome Trust Postdoctoral Fellow at the Royal Veterinary College and at the Barham Institute in Cambridge. Then he joined the Perbright Institute, formerly known as the Institute of Animal Health, and that was back in 1994 and focused on studies of the immune response to viral infections in cattle. He has provided advice on studies of the immune response to viral infections in cattle and expertise on the design of infectious disease challenge models for a wide range of pathogens in important agricultural species. His research groups Efforts are focused on understanding the immune response to foot and mouth disease virus in cattle and to develop novel vaccines. I haven't counted all of Brian's publications, but I, I'm pretty sure they are more than 120 or even more. And uh, he has done a lot of work on FMD and he has, he's now the director of the... He has been the director since December 2015. And uh, we are about to enjoy a conference by an outstanding scientist who contributed to the knowledge of the viral immunology in general and of FMD in particular. So it's an honor to have him here today. Uh, he, he will share with us all his experience of his research group in the development of commercial VLP vaccine production for FMD. It's for us an honor. I'm very happy. I consider him a friend. So Brian, the audience is all yours and we take questions afterwards. Hello everyone and thank you for the invitation to give this talk at the GFRA meeting. Uh, I'm going to tell you today about um, the translation of a virus-like particle foot and mouth disease vaccine uh, in, from research program into commercial development. One of the downsides of um, having commercial product under development is that uh, unfortunately there's quite a lot of information we can't share because of um, uh, commercial confidentiality but I'll, I'll try and give you a flavour of, um, of the progress we've made so far. As we all know uh, the current foot mouth disease vaccines are killed vaccines and there's currently a massive shortfall in the availability of vaccines globally, most strikingly in Africa and South Asia. And one of the reasons for that um, massive shortfall is how expensive it is to build the facilities to produce that vaccine, because it's large quantities of live foot and mouth disease virus, which are then inactivated. High containment facilities must be built and maintained um, to keep the environment safe um, around the production plants and also must ensure that the vaccine is free of any live virus um, before being used. These are quite laborious and expensive procedures to follow. Also, the inactivated foot mouth disease viruses are quite fragile structures, and I'll go on to describe that in more detail later, but they require expensive cold chains um, to deliver effective product to livestock keepers, and, and this instability can cause um, difficulties in producing effective vaccines also. And also extra downstream processes required to produce vaccines that allow identification of animals that have been infected or vaccinated, DIVA vaccines. And that, those, that downstream purification step to remove non-structural proteins can reduce the yield of vaccines and so increase in cost. So this is the capsid of FMDV uh, based on crystal structure. And uh, there are the three, four, three external capsid proteins, VP1, VP2, VP3 and internally VP4. And uh, the, there are pentamer structures, which I'm sure you'll all be aware of, that, that form the, the, the VLP. And um, I want you really to pay attention to this region here, this interface between VP2. This I'm going to focus on this a little bit in the next few slides. But as we know that you require this structure to um, stimulate protective immune responses, this, this intact structure, and if the structure becomes disassembled due to 
elevations in temperature or changes in pH, um, then the, the capsid disassembles into these pentamers. And once that happens, then you don't have an effective vaccine. So it's essential to retain the integrity of the capsid proteins. And so we, we published this work, but we've done some work um, looking at that uh, interface of VP2, as I showed you earlier, with the two alpha helices um, facing each other. And we've, we've developed an in silico modeling program where we can uh, model changes at that interface that will improve the stability. This is the point at where the pentamers start to uh, zip up, unzip apart. Uh, and so this is the region where to, to improve stability, you, you must make those changes. And, um, and so we can go through a step of in silico modeling um, to predict which, uh, what changes to make in a particular virus sequence to improve the stability. Then we can test the stability of that, um, that, that new structure uh, by uh, temperature and pH changes. This is an important step in, in uh, streamlining the, the process of selecting new mutations to stabilize the capsid. We also developed an assay, um, the thermofluor assay, to, to quickly measure the stability of any, any capsid or virus. Um, so traditionally, this was uh, carried out by sucrose gradient purification to demonstrate whether 146S particles were still present after heating um, or, or changes in pH. Uh, and that was far too laborious for a high throughput mechanism of, uh, to, of finding new stabilizing mutations. So all this requires is a PCR machine, uh, a cyber green dye, uh, and of course the virus sample. Um, and so the virus sample is placed into the PCR machine and the temperature is slowly ramped up. And when the virus genome um, emerges from the disassembling uh, capsid, then it, it binds the dye and you, you get a signal, fluorescent signal. And this is all published. So, but this is, this is what the traces look like. So this is some work we did with the SAT2. FMDV uh, inactivated virus and, and we can see here that the wild type uh, virus actually is about melts at about 40 degrees C um, but the, the, the best performing mutation is a single point mutation in the alpha helix that I was showing you in VP2 um, so to a tyrosine we've increased the melting temperature by about 5 degrees C so but what does that actually mean um, it's this sort of an acceleration, accelerated stability assay, really, and predicts how the how the capsid will, how stable the capsid will be under under different conditions. But what does it actually mean in terms of immunogenicity? So we, we carried out a study um, to immunise guinea pigs um, with with either the wild type uh, here in purple or the uh, stabilised that 93Y stabilised SAT2. Uh, inactivated virus and then one month after immunization these are the neutralizing antibody titers that we we saw and so this is a log scale so very high antibody titers to the mutated virus and this is the wild type virus which are largely baseline values and six months after that single immunization we've also got maintained the antibody titers and there's some elevation in the neutralizing antibody titers of the wild type so that all looked very encouraging and, and we wondered whether we could uh, introduce mutations into viruses in conventional production systems as a quick way of uh, improving the vaccines. Unfortunately, when we tried to grow this mutated virus, our commercial partner did, in, uh, in suspension culture and bioreactors, uh, it wouldn't grow very well. Uh, and after multiple passages, we did, or they did get it, they did get it to grow uh, well enough uh, consistent with commercial production. However, the virus had mutated back, not back to the wild type, but had mutated back to a amino acid change that reduced the stability to uh, roughly equivalent to the wild type. And so what that taught us is that it's very difficult to introduce stabilizing mutations into conventional uh, virus production systems and, uh, because the virus needs to be metastable to undergo its life cycle. So um, greatly encouraged by those results and working in parallel, we had a project to uh, develop uh, empty capsids using baculovirus expression. Uh, and so this would allow us to disconnect capsid production from the virus life cycle, it would hopefully allow us to use even uh, better, stronger stabilizing mutations. So again, this work is published in 2013, but 
but it, 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 just through it quickly, the construct we used in, in back of the virus expression was the P1 plus 2A and 3B. Um, and we know that uh, that polyprotein has to be processed by the virus 3C protease to form those individual capsid proteins, and then they assemble into the, in, into the capsid. But the trouble is the 3C protease kills the host cells. Uh, and so uh, when we first tried this with just a P1, 2A, 3C uh, construct, um, we, we had very little success, uh, very similar to many other people who've tried this. However, when we mutated the 3C protein uh, because of the crystal structure that had been solved um, by, uh, by Stephen Curry's group, um, we, we knew where to target a mutation to just reduce the protease activity. So we introduced a single point mutation into the 3C protease in the construct, and, and that gave some encouraging results. But still, the yields were not sufficiently high because the cells were uh, being killed too quickly. And so um, well, Ian Jones came up with the idea of introducing a frame shift mutation actually from HIV um, that uh, reduced translation beyond the, the frame shift. So about 80% translation efficiency than the first um, P1, and then only about 20% of, of that translation um, is occurring downstream of the frame shift. So we were able to reduce the quantity of 3C produced and the protease activity. And through that combination of, um, of, of changes in the construct, we were able to produce uh, stable empty capsids or empty capsids. And as I said, once, once we had disconnected from the virus life cycle, um, we could now put in quite extreme uh, mutations that would stabilize the capsid. So we could introduce new covalent bonds, new cysteine bridge um, across that alpha helix interface of VP2, or uh, this hydrophobic stacking. Um, that, that would also cause a very strong strong bond. The, the, the virus won't tolerate the, this, uh, live virus won't tolerate this stabilizing mutation because it, it can't um, disassemble uh, effectively and, 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 and continue its life cycle, but, but it works very well in the empty capsids and we now have capsids stable at 56 degrees C for, for over two hours and resistant to changes in pH. And again, published data, this is, this is one of the studies we did to show that um, a prime boost um, would, would give us at least nine months duration of immunity. And we, we've done other duration of immunity studies and, and they're very similar to this for other serotypes. Um, this was an A serotype. Um, and that, that, and uh, I think we'll consistently be able to get um, nine months up to a year's duration of immunity um, with, 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 uh, with these uh, stabilized uh, capsids. So where, where are we in terms of trying to develop different uh, capsids for different serotypes? So we, we focused on a quadrivalent vaccine that contains A, O, Asia, and, and SAP2. Um, and, and here we can see that the empty capsids that we can produce um, for uh, all these different serotypes um, and, um, and then we can formulate them as a quadrivalent vaccine. And um, uh, that, that seems to be uh, working uh, quite well as a, as a quadrivalent product and it was just the uh, inactivated uh, FMDV um, for comparison. Um, and, and particularly pleasing to get the O serotype working well, very well, because um, that's a, quite a relatively unstable uh, virus and, um, and uh, a lot of challenges in getting the SAT2 to, to be stabilized and, 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 and have to use some stabilizing methods that I haven't shown you. Um, already uh, to, to, to get that one to work, but we now have very stable SAT2 capsids also. And then protection. Um, so uh, again, just a, a summary slide and, and it's self-evident really that um, we've now got BLPs in head-to-head -head comparison with the classic inactivated vaccine and we've got uh, neutralizing antibody titers in excess of 1.5 log 10. Uh, many much higher than that um, with, with after single immunization and then uh, protection equivalent to um, greater than six PD50 with, with all of these uh, BLPs. So we're in a very strong position to enter into um, uh, trials for, for regulatory affairs to get a, a, a licensed product um, and that's our focus now for the next uh, next couple of years.
Um, so the, the processing of, of these caps is obviously important, cost of goods and, and manufacturing, and, and we, again, that's been streamlined by the team at uh, MSD Animal Health. Um, so almost a conventional baculovirus uh, culture system, so um, uh, insect cells uh, in, a, in, in bioreactors infected with a recombinant baculovirus, uh, harvesting the culture, uh, and then, then there has to be an activation step um, because you have to inactivate the, um, the recombinant baculovirus, which is still present in, in, in the suspension. Um, that couldn't go into the final product, but, but we developed... Um, uh, an activation process that, that will um, not um, that doesn't affect the the integrity of the virus-like particles, particularly the stabilised ones, and then a concentration step, and then um, uh, formulation. Um, so so we don't need to um, actually go through any more levels of purification because there are to, to get a DIVA compatible vaccine because um, there there are no um, there are no non-structural proteins in the construct. Uh, so the the, the, um, the animals uh, that are vaccinated with these VLPs don't respond to the the three ABC ELISA that's commercially available. Um, so this is the the workflow. If if we have a new vaccine uh, a virus that we need to make a vaccine for, we can design the mutations in silico. I haven't shown you this data, but we can express the virus-like particles in a rapid transient system. So transient transfection system. This has been a recent development in the last few years, we can get sufficient quantities from that rapid system to test the stability for sure, and even sufficient quantities if we wanted to, to, um, to test the immunogenicity. But we, we, so we can see such a strong link through many studies between once we have a stable VLP, we know that that will stimulate a, a, a robust uh, antibody response. There's a real link between those two, um, th those two factors. And if that, if then we select the, the chosen mutations for that for the particular virus that we're making a vaccine for, and that will that is will be different for different viruses. Um, there isn't one mutation that will fit all. Um, then we make the recombinant baculovirus, produce the material at scale, and, and can go on to re regulatory studies, uh, and, and then hopefully consequently to be used as a vaccine or bring in a new vaccine. So this can happen quite quickly. You know, within less than a week we can design mutations. Probably a couple of weeks, we can be sure that we've got a stable VLP, and then it's the process of, of scaling up. Um, again, can be done quite quickly. So, what are the what are the benefits of uh, the stabilised VLP? Um, just to summarise, really, so improved storage characteristics because they are more stable. They're quite an important point, as many of you know. Um, antigen is currently killed with virus. Antigen is currently stored in liquid nitrogen and has to be thawed, formulated, and and, and that can result in a significant delay, especially in response to an emergency. Whereas we know that this vaccine can be stored as a formulated product um, at four degrees for prolonged periods of time. And, and so uh, it will be ready for deployment almost immediately, which is one of the main reasons why we started this project, actually, as an emergency response vaccine. But it, it looks like it's um, going to be uh, very useful in endemic countries too. Most importantly, safe production. There's no live virus at any step in this uh, process so it can be low containment less expensive production facilities and, and of course you, you you know that you won't be uh, have any live virus in your in your final product and i sort of touched on this already but you know very rapid response to new virus strains um, don't even need to isolate the virus and adapt and then adapt to tissue culture sequence gene synthesis and expression um, it can be very quick um, opportunities for further development um, I've got enhanced early response. I think enhanced duration of immunity was, it would be more important. Um, you can, now you've got a stable capsid to work with, stable recombinant capsid to work with. You can start thinking about adding um, like conjugation uh, type uh, of approaches to vaccine to conjugate uh, potent CD4 epitopes uh, to that to those VLPs to stimulate a CD4 T cell response and so consequently increase the duration of immunity. And, and potentially increased antigenic breadth. So we've got a program um, that um, to immunise animals with, uh, with with the VLPs, and then uh, sequence uh, individual B cells, um, produce recombinant antibodies, and start to really interrogate the antigenic surface of that VLP from from uh, for, for different serotypes, um, uh, uh, antibodies produced from response to different serotypes, and so. Um, 
we can start to understand whether we can make modifications to those epitopes to increase the breadth of immunity. I think it's important at this point to say, and, and one piece of feedback from a few years ago was the question was raised whether these VLPs, they're a single sequence, they're not a quasi-species like inactivated vaccine, and so there's, they, they wouldn't uh, induce the same breadth of immunity against different strains that the live virus vaccine the inactivated vaccine does. Um, that, that is not the case. We've done a lot of those studies with a number of different serotypes and can show after immunizing animals with a, with a VLP vaccine and, and producing high uh, antibody, uh, neutralizing antibody titers and then seeing how well that sera neutralizes strains of, of within the serotype, we get good cross protection, broadly equivalent to the, to the cross protection you get um, to the uh, to high potency um, killed vaccines, so that that is an issue. Breadth um, from these VLP vaccines is, is largely similar to the, in, the inactivated vaccine, and of course, finally, there are no non-structural proteins um, at all, so uh, compatible with DIVA diagnostics, as I've already said. I think the other thing that um, that surprised us a little bit was that, in addition to the stability and improved stability uh, for storage and immunogenicity. Um, Clearly, the increased stability enhances production. Uh, the quantity of, ant of uh, antigen that you produce, um, the, the, the yields are higher with these stabilized um, VLPs. And maybe that's not surprising that um, once the VLPs form, they're locked into, into position and there's no disassembly even during that culture process in the in insect cells. So uh, uh, a bigger benefit than we expected in terms of production from the stabilizing mutations. That just leaves me to thank um, uh, people we've been working with for over 10 years now. Um, it's um, a lot of major technical challenges to overcome um, and, uh, and, and so very grateful to the stru structural biologists at Oxford and at the uh, UK synchrotron, the diamond light source, uh, ourselves at Thurbright and working also with the World Reference Laboratory, uh, helpful in, in, in helping us select strains to develop, develop VLPs from. Um, University of Reading, Ian Jones, who's a baculovirus expression expert uh, and uh, main driver of designing those constructs. And uh, MSD Animal Health, Erwin van der Vaughan, who um, uh, uh, has been uh, just amazed as me um, the the advances they've made in, uh, in in the production of these VLPs and the, and the increased um, productivity uh, that they've achieved from from the same constructs that we provided them, uh, it's uh, it's it's fantastic working with such a such a um, strong team in, in the company. Uh, so uh, thank you all for listening, and uh, very happy to answer any questions if anything isn't clear. Uh, let's take a uh mute. Sorry. Now, okay, here I am. So I, I was talking a lot and no one listened to me. That's great. Okay. Well, I, I will just take questions from the from the audience and I have my questions myself. Thank you for, for that very nice presentation. Uh, I was thinking, um, just I, I take the first one. Um, when you were designing the, this new this antigen, you never thought about uh, adding a positive uh, marker for Diva, or it, because we know we have this negative marker that well, there are no non-structural proteins. But for some vaccines, uh, you, you you add like a positive marker for Diva. Was that is that an option? What what do you think? Well, no, well I, you know, the, the value is obviously in the negative deep, the real value to demonstrate there's no infection circulating. But it's actually, you know, there isn't a lot of scope to add, a, add an epitope in there. So work we did a little while ago, led by Julian Siago, there's actually very little capacity to, while you maintain that structure, it's quite short peptides can only be inserted into uh, into the capsid. So it, it wouldn't, uh, the, the negative aspects of disrupting the structure, I think, far outweigh the benefits. Okay, I have another question here from the from the audience. Uh, they say that mRNA, mRNA vaccines have gained a lot of attention recently. Uh, he says that 
messenger RNA FMD research has been ongoing even before COVID outbreak. How does the stabilized BLP compare to messenger RNA vaccines in terms of incorporating new strains and a speed of production? That's Charles and Fon. Yeah, so you know we've done we've done some work with uh, RNA vaccines as, ourselves as well, and um, it, it is challenging. You know, and it's still you you still have that challenge of the three C protease. The the RNA vaccine you know gives produces three C protease. It, it has to to process the the VLPs. So so in in summary, I think um, at the moment that is going to be very challenging if you want to form a capsid. Um, it's not, you know, in some ways, the, 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 the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine was quite straightforward. A single glycoprotein, you just express it. FMDV is a lot more difficult to do. We've had some success with it, but um, there's, there's, there's a lot of things to sort out before that become a reality. Okay. okay. And here is Teresa. I think that perhaps she probably missed it from the slides, but what are the doses of, VRP, of VLP you are using, the antigen payload? Um, yeah, they're, they're, I, or, <laughs> I dodge this question a little bit, but it's roughly the same as inactivated vaccine. It's in the same ballpark, so, yeah. Okay. And uh, if there's something else from the audience, I have another one. Uh, how do you think that the, the immune response is different from the inactivated particles? Because in the inactivated particles, you also have RNA, the viral RNA, there is a pump itself and that can activate the innate immune response. Did you find any difference perhaps in the, in the kinetics of uh, the, I don't know if the isotypes of the VDT or how, how does it impact? Because one would think that perhaps if you don't have a TLR agonist in your antigen, it may, might make a difference. I don't know if someone explored that. So we've, we've, we've looked at, we've, I wouldn't say that was the aim of our uh, objective of our studies but you know I touched on there that we've done a lot of single b-cell sequencing looking at antibody responses in in some detail um, we can't see big differences in in the response to inactivated vaccine and and capsid the structure's the same I didn't say that in the talk we know the structure's the same um, and we don't see any major differences the biggest difference by far is adjuvants that, yeah, that, that's, that's uh, we've, you know, again, I, I didn't mention that, but, you know, we're using a, a, a new adjuvant and okay. uh, that, that can make a huge difference. Okay, okay. so you, you may be activating the innate immune response by using this different, more potent yeah, yeah. adjuvant. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, Just yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, and then uh, someone is asking if you have tried these vaccines in swine. No, we haven't yet. Okay. Uh, and then Luis. Oh, is no, saying, sorry, that isn't true. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we've got so much data. Yes, we have. And, uh, and, and they work. And, and they work, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, the reason I, uh, yeah, no, I just forgot. <laughs> okay. Uh, Luis says that he agrees that the challenge is the processing of the capsid by 3C and the toxicity of this protein to cells. I think they are, he's talking about them messenger RNA vaccines or something like that. Have you considered modified 3C protein that is not toxic to cells? This is Luis Rodriguez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, Luis. <laughs> Too many years <laughs> since we've seen you. Um, the, uh, yeah, you can use the same, we can, you can use the modifications we've used or there's been other published modifications for, for the 3C protease and, and, and they can be incorporated into RNA vaccines, for sure. There's but another yes. question from Emily saying that if you use BEI for the inactivation step, I don't think so, but... Uh, BEI is one of the things we've used. Oh, okay, you do, yeah. you do. Yeah. for the baculoviruses. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, if there's something else, nothing else on the chat, um, so... I don't know. I think I just to congratulate you, to thank you so much for being here today with us, sharing all this information. And well, and invite you and all the, the rest of, of the audience to, to go to Gather Town, to visit the posters and to enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Brian, very much. Okay, thank you for the invitation.
Bye. Bye.